Last time we saw in Cain unconverted man's hatred of God. In fact, Cain is the first example of what Scripture refers to as the world. The three enemies of the Christian are the devil, who is the leader of the fallen angels, the demons. The flesh, which is every fallen man's sinful nature, both believer and unbeliever. And the world, which is the collective totality of the fallen natures of all unconverted people. The world is the unconverted. And 1 John 4, 5 says, of every spirit that does not confess Jesus Christ, they are of the world. Therefore, they speak as of the world and the world is hears them. What is this disposition that unites the entire unconverted world? Well, again, we saw it is hatred of God. I know probably 99% of believers would say, and unbelievers would say they don't hate God, and maybe 90% of Christians would say, oh, unbelievers don't really hate God. But the Bible over and over again says every unbeliever to some degree actually does hate God. 1 John 7, 7, Jesus said to his brothers who were, who were not believing in him, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. That's what Jesus said to his unbelieving brothers. They can't hate you, the world, because you are the world, but it hates me. Therefore, what? You hate me because I testify of it that its works are evil. And that's the very reason we saw that Cain killed Abel. Because Abel's works were righteous and his brothers were evil. And Abel's works made that known. And so he hated his brother. And he killed him. And this, beloved, is the reality that we are in today. Every moment of our lives, the world is at war with God. John said of his disciples, Jesus rather said of his disciples in John 17, 14, I have given them, my disciples, your word and the world has hated them. Even as it has hated me because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. That's the condition for the world's hatred. To be not of the world. Jesus was not of the world. All of us who are believers are not of the world. Therefore the world hates him. Therefore the world hates us. Well in today's text we're going to get the summation of the world's activity up until the flood. About 1600 years of history is summarized for us in these few verses near the end of Genesis chapter 4. And here's the question that I want us to consider. How are we to live in the world without being of the world? In fact, even more specifically, how does God want us as believers to understand and respond to the works of the unconverted in this world. A very precise subject that I want us to consider this morning. Let's ask God's blessing as we turn to his word. Father, again, we just pause for a moment that we would ask for your blessing, that we would ask for your spirit, that we would ask for right understanding and indeed faith in your word and repentance from sins. We want your word to grow in us, that we would grow in you. Do this, Lord, for your name's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear now the word of the Lord from Genesis chapter 4, beginning in verse 17. This is God's holy word. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad begot Mahujael, and Mahujael begot Methushael. And Methushael begot Lamech. Then Lamech took for himself two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the second was Zillah. And Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the harp and flute. And as for Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain. An instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Naamah. Then Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. For I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. 
If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. The word of the Lord. I want you to notice, first of all, this morning, the culture of man. I want you to notice the culture of man. A little background here at the beginning. Verse 17. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Now, this is not the good Enoch of Seth's line, who was so righteous, he walked with God, and God took him. They have some of the same names in the two lines, the line of Cain and the line of Seth. This is a different Enoch. The only thing we know about him is what we read in this verse. And notice here, Cain builds the first human city. He builds a city. No doubt he is trying to find for himself security. Security because he's afraid anybody's going to kill him. And a city would give him that security. Um, And in fact, the word only means that he built some dwellings with a wall around them. That's all the word city means. You could even translate it village. It's the same word for village. But it means that they're all connected. They're all within a walled area, which would show you again Cain's desire for security because what was his concern when God judged him and put that mark upon him? It was, it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. Well, what's the best way to defend against that? Put a bunch of other people with you and put a wall around your dwelling place. And so that was the motivation, no doubt, for Cain's building the city. Also, he did not believe. He did not believe that God would protect him. God put the mark on him for his protection. That's what God says. I'll put a mark on you so that anybody who sees you will know that I personally will avenge anyone who would kill you seven times over. So to protect Cain, God puts a mark on him. Cain doesn't trust in the mark, doesn't trust in God. He's going to protect himself. He's going to build a city. And by the way, it actually says, it's imperfect in the Hebrew. It says Cain was building a city. Never says that he finished. I don't think he did get get out from under God's judgment that he would be a wanderer and a vagabond. He starts to build a city, but it never says that he finished. And he names the city after his son. Why? You, You name a city after yourself. We well, can't name it after himself. His, his word is a curse. His name is a curse, rather. Cain, the accursed one. Cain, the mark, the murderer of his brother. So he has to name it after his son. Of course, Cain goes out. Notice the first thing we see, he uh, knew his wife. He has intercourse with his wife. That's the Hebrew word, know, has that meaning. Knows her intimately. She conceived and bore Enoch. Sometimes it said, where did Cain get his wife? Clearly, she was his sister. Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters, it said. And I believe, as Calvin and many others, that she was already married to him when he offers his offering, when Abel offers his offering, and she goes out with him. It would have been difficult for him to to get anybody who stayed in the camp when he's driven out to follow him. But I think Cain had a wife already, and maybe there were some other younger couples who came out with Cain. Who knows? The point is is that not until the human race multiplied enough so that there could be a distinction between fraternal love, love between brothers and sisters, and conjugal love, love between husbands and wives, not until the population grew enough could that love be distinguished. You'd have to have separate families and clans to where now you could begin to see, oh, we're brothers and sisters, therefore we ought not to be spouses. And so there is nothing wrong with them. This is God's plan that brothers and sisters would be married. We know that later in the Old Testament, God has laws that forbid marriage among close relations. We see that in Leviticus 18 and other places where there are four degrees, parents, children, grandparents, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, aunts, uncles, and then cousins. And by the way, that is the Roman law as well, the law of the Roman Empire. That four degrees of relations you could not be married to. Same degrees. It's in China. Same thing. Why? Because it's built into our nature that fraternal love is to be distinguished from conjugal love. But you couldn't do that until you had separate families. And also, let's recognize that Adam and Eve in them is the entire genetic code of the human race. 
It was so much more rich, so much more diverse than ours. There would have been no danger in their children marrying each other of any kind of birth defects or anomalies for generations. They could continue brother, sister, brother, sister. Not until the genetic code got so uh, uh, diffused down to where we are today to, is it you know, harmful, potentially harmful for a brother and sister to marry because, they, again, they greatly increase birth defects, but their genetic code would not have had those issues. So for all these reasons, there is nothing wrong with what we see here in this text. And in fact, if you would believe in the scientific theory of evolution and a human being evolving from, you know, paramecium ultimately, how are you going to have them mate? The same kind of thing, two people must eventually mate and begin to reproduce. And so you would have the same thing, two who were related to one another. But at their marriages, Adam and Eve would have left. I'm sorry, um, at, at, their, at their children's marriages, the children would have left Adam and Eve and they would have clinged to their spouses, right? And they would begin their own households. And we theorize that that's probably why we get the story of Cain and Abel, that Cain and Abel are now adult men, whether that's considered to be, you know, uh, adolescent adulthood or whether it's their own families. I estimated that they're probably about 65 or 70 years old because the pre-flood genealogies don't show any human man having children until at least 65 years of age. And so because they're living 900 years old, everything's longer. Every age period is longer. A woman's going to be having children for maybe 200 years. She's going to be the, the fertile years. Think of it, parents. Not one or two years in diapers, but 10 or 15 years in diapers. I mean, everything would have been longer, right? So 65, I said, was probably about 16 in the way they were aging. And so 65 or 70 years have gone by. Why am I saying that? There's quite a lot of people in the world. Adam and Eve would have had dozens of children in this time period. Most scholars believe that they would regularly have twins, that twins was the way in which the early women would have give, given birth, again, with the rich genetic pool that they had, so that Cain and Abel were twins. Jabel and Jubal, down in the later uh, line, are twins, that this was the normal way. So they would have had all of these children, plus we see that implied in verses 8 and verse 14 of our text. And again, I just want to do some of this background work to show the, the factual account here of Genesis 4. Notice when Cain kills Abel, he talks with him first, verse 8, and then it comes to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against him. Why does Cain make sure he gets Abel way out in the field before he kills him? Because there were other people around. There were other people. That's the only reason why he takes him out in the field. If there was just Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel, he just has to get Abel anywhere. But he has to talk with them while they're in the camp with the other people people running around their brothers and sisters and then he has to get him out in the field by himself we also see the connotation the implication that there were other people in the world when Cain is protesting God's judgment in verse 14 when Cain's saying I'll be a fugitive a vagabond and then he says this and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me now why would he say that if there's only Adam Eve and Cain Anyone who finds, because there were dozens of other people at this time. In fact, I want to show you, I think there were hundreds of people on the earth when Cain goes out of the city of men or the, the dwelling places of men to form his own city, the first city. And that's where we see where Seth replaces Cain as the head of the house. That's what, that's what we're seeing here. The Bible is only tracing for us the line of the seed of the serpent and the line of the seed of the woman because that's all that the scriptures are interested in showing us they're not giving us a complete history of all these different families we get Cain and Abel twins Eve thinks Cain is the seed Cain kills Abel Eve knows Cain isn't the seed anymore and so when she gives birth to her next son God would have communicated to her this is the one to replace Abel whom Cain killed and that's exactly what she says in chapter Four, verse 25, the verse I left out, the next verse after our text. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son, and she named him Seth. For, she says, God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. Now, why would she do that if that was hundreds of years or dozens of years later? If this was right after Abel's kill. This is her next child, 
Seth. And she knows somehow God would have made it known to her just as God made known that Isaac was the promised one and Jacob and not Esau was the promised one. So also God would have communicated to Eve that it's through Seth. And so he gets the covenant headship. That's why we're learning about him, not his older brothers and sisters who would have been on the earth when Cain and Abel were on the earth before he was born. But notice in chapter 5, verse 3, how old Adam is when Seth is born. Look at it. And Adam lived 130 years, and he begot a son in his own image and in his own likeness and named him Seth. It's 130 years when Seth is born. And Seth has to be born right after Abel, Cain and Abel are or uh, after Cain kills Abel. And so really, my bare minimum of 65 or 70 years on the earth is probably more like 125 or 130. There's 130 years past when Seth is born. So when Cain goes out of the garden, shortly before Seth is born, 125 years, there are hundreds of people on the earth. This is how it was possible for him to build a city. Scripture is not wrong. Scripture is true. These words, if you just begin to unpack them and look at it, Scripture is giving us just what we need to know. Why? Because it's showing us, again, the promise of salvation is going to be fulfilled, even though the serpent and the seed of the serpent is going to try to stop it, the seed of the woman is going to come and is going to prevail. And that's what we see in this text. And so I want you to notice Cain builds a city. He builds a city, again, Maybe a few dozen dwellings with a wall around it. It doesn't have to be some Taj Mahal, just some stone wall, as it were. It's a city. And a city, beloved, is a great cultural development. Cities afford all sorts of opportunities and advantages that non-cities don't have. In a city, you have all kinds of people working together. They can share the results of their work, the fruits of their labor, right? The blacksmith can share with the crop uh, person who comes in and sells his crops and the, and the furniture maker can, can share with the doctor and so forth and everybody's uh, occupations can bless one another and the society can really prosper and grow. You have all these opportunities. Wealth can be developed more. You can get more people behind something at once because you have a bunch of people in close proximity. So cities afford all kinds of unique opportunities and advantages. Cities are not bad. They're not inherently bad. They're not inherently good either. They can be used for good. They can be used for evil. Jesus is building a city, the new Jerusalem. It's going to come down from heaven. I know sometimes we get emphasized in the PCA and reform circles. Well, you have to be doing you know, ministry in the city or somehow you're less pleasing to God. It's just nonsense. Wherever there's a sinner that needs saved, that's where you should be doing your work. Whether it's in the, the country is no less important than the city. I, I get tired of hearing that all the time. The city, the city, the city. The city is what Cain built. The city is where Cain built something in order to secure himself. And again, cities can be good, and there can be good in the city, and there can be good in the country. The next development we see is the development of animal husbandry in verse 20. Jabel is the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but this word livestock is a broad word. It includes things like camels, horses, donkeys, you know, cows, and it can include sheep too. It's just basically any domesticated animal that you would have. And notice they dwell in tents now. This isn't like Abel who's still living, you know, in his home in the area of humans. This is the nomadic shepherd life. They're going around with their flocks because they're big flocks and they need new fields to graze all the time. So they're living in tents as they go around and the flocks are growing and the herds are growing because mankind is growing and there's greater need. There's a city now that they have to feed. And they need the, the animals for clothing And they need the animals for sacrifice, and they need the animals for work, and they need the animals for travel. But some scholars think that it's in Cain's line at this time, that though God had not given them permission, Cain's line begins to eat the animals that were supposed to be offered to God when their skins were used for clothing. Kyle and Delitz, for example, think that Cain, uh, without a word from God, begins to do that here. But whatever the case may be, animal husbandry is important. To have all these animals, they no doubt would have been using their milk, they would have been using the wool, they would have been using the leather, they would have been using them for plowing fields, for transporting things, for all sorts of things. Maybe even for armies, horses and camels. The next thing that we see is verse 
21. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of those who play the harp and flute. Here is the beginning of music and the arts. Once again, God giving good gifts to men. But what I want you to see here, all of this culture, and all of it is important, right? It comes through the line of Cain. The, the seed of the serpent. The one who hates God. Doesn't make culture bad. But it's interesting, and I want to comment on this again. There's one final one. And that's the father of metallurgy and, and blacksmithing. Which is verse 22. As for Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. Bronze and iron. Now those are broad words and it can mean all sorts of things. They didn't really distinguish between the metals like we do today. But bronze sometimes is called copper. We're not even sure exactly which kind. Chromium could also be in there, which is a very hard, it's a hardening substance for iron. And in fact, even though largely speaking, I know scholars will say Stone Age, Long Period, Bronze Age, Long Period, Iron Age. That's not true and it's not clean cut. Even the British Encyclopedia, um, uh, Britannica, admits in the Middle East, iron had limited use as a source in precious metal as early as 3000 BC. And they say the Iron Age doesn't start till 1200. But they admit they find weapons and they find tools made of iron in 3000 BC. But man didn't really know the difference yet and which was stronger, sometimes even up to 1000 BC. Armies are still preferring bronze because it's lighter. And they didn't really recognize the difference. So don't get caught up in those things. But what I want you to see here is that man is using his mind. He's using his gifts. He is developing society. Civilization is growing. He is subduing the world, even the line of Cain. That is opposed to God. And that is not doing any of these things for the glory of God. And so I want you to notice, secondly, the the common grace of God. I want you to notice the common grace of God. So culture comes about not through the, the... the redeemed line, not through the believers, but culture comes about through the unbelievers, through the line of the serpent. Normally with grace, we think of God's saving grace, right? By God's grace, we're regenerated. By God's grace, we're given the gift of faith, given the gift of repentance, made more like Christ. God, by his grace, gives us the means of grace, the word, the sacraments, prayer, by which, again, we can ordinarily expect God to be at work in us. But there's also another kind of grace. There's a grace that theologians refer to as common grace. It doesn't have to do with salvation. It has to do with the fact that God is good. Because God is good. His good gifts overflow to all of his creatures. This is why the lilies of the field are clothed more gloriously than Solomon. This is why even one single sparrow that falls to the ground, God cares about, God knows... This is why God could tell Jonah when he wants God to strike Nineveh and wipe it off the earth that the the city even has much cattle. Should I just kill cows for nothing, Jonah? God cares about his creatures and God is good. Psalm 145 verse 9. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all of his works. These tender mercies, these common grace, blessings and gifts greatly increase the happiness of man and they're given to all. This is what Jesus told his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 44. I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. I don't know about you, but I struggle with that one. That you may be sons of your father in heaven. Why? Because he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. You know, the rain feels just as good to unbelievers as it does to believers. It makes their crops grow just as well as it does to the person who loves God. And food tastes just as good. Paul says that he filled our hearts with food and gladness as he preaches to the pagans in Lystra. Food tastes just as good to unbelievers as it does to believers. In fact, oftentimes God gives unbelievers more of the so-called natural gifts. Right? That's what 1 Corinthians teaches us, that not many rich, not many noble, not many mighty are called according to the flesh. God chooses the poor and the despised to shame the strong. Among the redeemed, it's often the, the weaker, the, the less gifted that are chosen. But God's good gifts are on all his creatures and especially on mankind who are worth more than many sparrows, including unbelievers. You know, there are only two genealogies before the flood. The genealogy of Cain, we get it in 
this chapter and the genealogy of Seth because there's only two kinds of people in the world before the flood. There are no nations. There are no races. There are no languages. There's the seed of the woman, the believing line, and the seed of the serpent, the unbelieving line. And when Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, he left God. And his children have no parts in him. He fathers uh, children, and his children father children. And he lives not by the will of God, by his own will. And yet God does not abandon Cain and his line. God continues to give good gifts to them, to give creative abilities. They develop music, which we use to worship God. They develop farming techniques, animal husbandry, uh, being able to be ranchers and all that, that we use to this day. They develop metallurgy and all sorts of blacksmithing that's all around us. Metal objects, wooden objects, plastic objects. There cannot be society without these things. And all of these things come from the line of Cain. Come from the children of Lamech, who is the culmination of the line of Cain. God continues to pour good gifts, beloved, on unbelievers. And we benefit from them. And we are to benefit from them and we are to use them. All of this does is God's goodness to the wicked despite their impiety just renders their sin all the more inexcusable. God already has given them knowledge of himself. They know he's there. They have a moral compass. They know they're doing wrong when they don't acknowledge him. And then he gives them good gifts. And still they don't turn to him. It's not enough. But you and I continue to benefit from unbelievers around us. And we need to thank God for that. You know, the legal and political institutions that we prize in Western democratic Republican society are all based on the legal and political institutions of Rome. The way in which we have developed uh, concepts and, and thought is the philosophy of the Greeks. Even theological terms, substance, essence, persons, that's all philosophical terms. It was the Greeks who developed philosophy. It was the Greeks who developed art that we have. John Calvin commenting on how many different things that we have gotten and been blessed by as believers from pagan says this, quote, the experience of all ages teaches us how widely the rays of divine light have shown, listen, on unbelieving nations. He says, for the benefit of the present life. And we see at the present time, now it's 1500s, Calvin's present time. We see at the present time that the excellent gifts of the Spirit, listen to this, are diffused through the whole human race. Who can deny that? He closes the quote with, quote, the liberal arts and sciences have descended to us from the heathen. Who can deny that? And we're blessed by that. And we need to thank God for that. I don't know about you, but when I go to the doctor, I don't ask, are you a Christian? I don't want to care to tell you the truth. I kind of hope he is. But I want to know if he's a good doctor. I want to see his track record. I want to know how many of these surgeries he's performed before. Right? I mean, that's what you should do. When you go to a mechanic, do you want to know if he's a believer? Or do you want to know if he's a good mechanic and, and has a reputation for honesty? You know, when I go to the polls and vote, and I know this one causes people spasms, but I don't care if it's a believer. Is he going to do things? Is his policies most in line with what the Bible says? In my whole lifetime, I haven't had a single election where that choice has not been very easy. It's very easy to see who's saying what's more in line with Scripture. I don't care about their lives as far as who wins the election. I mean, I care about them as much as I'm to love my neighbors. But, I mean, this is the way God brings gifts to this world. The gifts of God do not show forth repentance or faith that's in the fruits of the spirit the gifts of the spirit are on all and oftentimes more on the unbeliever than the believer not the evangelical gifts but the common gifts you know being able to be good at math or just being diligent or having ideas about how to develop flutes and and lyres Uh, this kind of gift and, and intelligence and learning god gives to all We can't deny it, and we need to thank him for it. But I want you to notice, thirdly, the corruption of God's good gifts. The corruption of God's good gifts. The gifts, the common gifts of God, do not bring conversion. They do not bring salvation. But they leave man without excuse because God is continuing to shower unbelieving, rebellious man 
with benefits, with good gifts. Because God's goodness is not stopped because of man's wickedness. God continues to be who he is. And he pours out good upon all. You know, the final person in this line is the line of Cain. I'm sorry, is, uh, the, is the person Lamech. Lamech is mentioned. You know, we get the entire genealogy, as it were, in verse 18. Enoch, Ired, Mahujael, Mahushael, Lamech. And Lamech, if you count it, is the seventh generation from Adam, Adam being one, through Cain. This is this line of the seed of the serpent. And seven in Hebrew is perfection, is completion. The reason why the Holy Spirit includes this genealogy is to show us, to show all people, the culmination of what it happened, what happens and what it means to live without God. Lamech is the culmination of the world. Lamech is the perfection, as it were, of a world that does not want to acknowledge God. And notice what Lamech does. The very first thing we see, Lamech took for himself two wives. The most foundational institution that God has given to human beings to image him. Father, son, proceeding from them spirit. Husband, wife, proceeding from them children. The most foundational institution, only one man and only one woman can become one flesh. And Lamech, the father of the world, as it were, takes two wives. Takes two wives. He redefines marriage according to his own benefit, according to his own desires, according to his own pleasures. No doubt he would be able to have much more wealth, much more power now in this early stage of mankind. Double the offspring, double the influence. And we see his arrogance in his song, which we'll look at in a moment. But Lamech is about clearly the outward, the external, having more in this world. We see this in his two wives. Ada is from the word ornament or to adorn oneself with ornaments. Zillah is from clinking or tinkling of many metal pieces of jewelry. And Nehemiah, even his sister, verse 22, means gorgeous. These people are all about the outward, all about the external, all about the worldly, all about the temporal. The external is not wrong. The external is good. God cares about the external. In fact, God often blesses his people with many things in the external. As you can see, if you would go to Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 10, God says of Israel, I clothed you in embroidered cloth. I gave you sandals of badger skin. I clothed you with fine linen. I covered you with silk. I adorned you, with same word, adorned, Ada, with ornaments, put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. I put a jewel in your nose, earrings in your ears, a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver. Your clothing was of fine linen, silk, embroidered cloth. You ate pastry of fine flour, honey, and oil. You were exceedingly beautiful. The outward matters. God blesses his people with the outward and takes it away when he's chasing them. But beloved, the outward is not more important than the inward. And we can worship God without the outward. We can know the joy of the Lord in a prison if we have faith. We can know the joy of the Lord in the midst of great poverty, in the midst of great pain, in the midst of great sickness, in the midst of death. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. God is with me. The external can never replace the internal. It's an idol when it does. When it becomes the only thing, it's idolatry. This is why Peter said to women, do not let your adornment be merely outward, the arranging the hair, the wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the the sight of God. This is true for all of us. We should all desire the inward rather than the outward. We should all be more concerned with, am I becoming like Christ in my heart? Am I turning from sin? Am I embracing righteousness? It doesn't matter how much I have. It doesn't matter who's in the White House. It doesn't matter, are we even at war or peace? I mean, we want those things. We want good things. We want to have a, an, a better time of it. Nobody wants to have surgery. Right? You don't want to be sick. But these things don't keep you from God. And we need to recognize that. That gentle and quiet spirit. Paul says that we are to pray for kings that we can all lead a quiet life. Same thing for all of us. Gentleness that Jesus himself modeled. This is for all of us. We should desire the inward. But 
Cain's line desires the outward. That's why he takes a second wife. It's not about being and imaging God and glorifying him. It's about having as much as he can. And here's a guy who basically is just using his strength to take whatever he wants. He objectifies women because he makes them possessions. That woman should be his own self. He should love her as himself. Rather than that, he takes another one, completely oppressing her and the new one. This is the first example that we get of what God warned Eve about in 316. Your desire will be for your husband. You sinfully will want to dominate him, and he sinfully will want to rule you. And that's what Lamech does. Some think that he tells them, his wives, this song, Ada and Zilla, hear my voice. Why is he telling them to intimidate them even further? You better not mess with me. You better not decide that you're going to gang up on me. I'll take you out just like that. Young man messed with me a little bit. I killed him. That's why, you know, he's telling us something that I don't personally think that's why. I think he's telling them that to assure them of how bold and how secure they are with him. Nobody's going to cause him to fall. But the point is, this is a man who lives by the outward who oppresses the weak. And in fact, this song, and there's a lot of controversy on this song, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, Lamech 77-fold. Is this something that he did, as many think, or is this something that he would do? There's a, there's a a, a kind of a figure in Hebrew where you have to translate the perfect into the imperfect. And Calvin actually believes that this is one of those cases. And so does the New International Commentary on the Old Testament, which is the most scholarly and technical commentary I use. It's very scholarly and te- uh, uh, technical. But both of them say that, that you should translate the verse this way. Lamech isn't actually saying what he did do. It's saying he's boasting about what he would do. I would kill a man for a bruise, even a child for a blow, you know, for a strike. That he's based boasting about that. But this Lamech actually remembers God's word in verse 24. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech 77-fold. Notice how he mocks God's protection of Cain. Mocks it. God's going to take vengeance on Cain seven times. Anybody even touches me, I'll take him out 77 times. This is a boastful, this is a prideful, this is an external oriented man who just takes what he can. He oppresses his wives. He takes two wives. He oppresses younger men. He threatens to kill them or he actually does kill them. And beloved, this is man's corruption of God's good gifts. God's gifts can't change man. They don't save man. Having more of them don't make man more, doesn't make man more holy. When people depart from God, they only get worse and worse. And the more God gives them, the more they use it for evil. And that's what we see in Lamech, the culmination of the world. And so fourthly and lastly, I want you to notice the culmination of humanism. I want you to notice the culmination of humanism. Humanism, humanism has often been described as man is the measure of all things. That's the way our world operates right now on a humanist basis. What matters is people and what's good for the most people, at least the people who can dominate the voices, what they believe everybody should have. But this is the line of Cain. This is the world. This is the world without God. Notice in this whole line, not a single mention of piety, of godliness, of faith. No remembrance of God in any of their actions. No instance of worship or of prayer or of the fear of the Lord or anybody intentionally uh, obeying God or naming their child in remembrance of God. Nothing. The names, if anything, mean things about worldly things. No God, no acknowledging No, nothing, only in what they can do, only in what they can do for themselves. It reminds me more and more of our institutions today. It really does. No acknowledgement of God, right, by our schools. Read the charter of Harvard and Yale. For the glory of God, for the furtherance of the gospel. They have nothing to do with that now. Dropping God from their slogans and from their names Same thing's true for the charters of the early states and the colonies for the glory of Jesus Christ to start, prosper the church. None of that now. Want to get rid of God. 
We still want the, we still want the temporal. We still want the prosperity. We still want the culture. But we don't want God. We see this in our media. We see this in sports. We see this in the news. We see this all over the place. No God. Institutions that were dedicated to God. We don't want God, but we want the benefit. The interests of Cain's family are in this world in serving themselves, not in serving God. Yes, they love culture. Yes, they want cities where we can do more stuff. But without God. One of the commentators said this about Cain's city. Quote, the first foundation stone of the kingdom of the world in which the spirit of the beast bears sway. That's civilization and culture without God. It's the city of the beast. City of Satan. Doesn't mean that things aren't good and beneficial. Man's advances in civilization and culture cannot hinder sin, cannot reduce evil, cannot produce, protect people from harm or make anybody better in the eyes of God. I wonder if, I wonder if you could check out Cain City and what if you found in Cain City zero crime? Nobody was doing violent acts of stealing or murder. What if you found that there was zero homeless in Cain City? He had solved the homeless problem. What if in Cain City there was 100% employment? What if there was 100% homeownership for everybody? What if in Cain City they had good schools and hospitals and everyone had health insurance and it was free and you got your loans repaid for college? What if it was all given to you? What if all of that was there in Cain City? Would anybody be any closer to God? There's no godliness in Cain City. They want worldly prosperity. That's, what, that's all we're told anymore. And so many Christians think, oh yes, that's building the kingdom of God. Christians in prisons in China are building the kingdom of God. Not by their acts, but by their faith. Beloved, we don't build the kingdom of God by things in this world that benefit us. We don't need them. We're going to die. We saw that in Ecclesiastes. Solomon built things like no one ever before him. And he said, it's all meaningless. It's vanity. What did I have in the end? Nothing. No, what we're going to see, Lord willing, is in the line of Seth, the preservation of hope and faith. And as we believe in God, we show forth the promise that God builds his kingdom and that God's going to bring his kingdom fully to the earth. And that's what we see in the line of Seth. And that's what we see in a sense, in the opposite sense, in the line of Cain. All these wonderful things from Cain's children, from Lamech's children. Some think that Lamech was able to kill people because his son, Tubal Cain, is making weapons for him. The first metallurgy, the first blacksmith. There's all sorts of things that you could, you could get by implication in this text, but... Beloved, it's good for us to work in, participate in, to further things in this world that bring prosperity to man, but don't ever think that you're making people better that way, that you're doing the work of Jesus that way. Those things are neutral as far as a man's soul. We can serve God with them. We can't serve any God any better with them or without them. It's by faith that we are pleasing to God, by faith alone, And faith doesn't need these things. It's good to have them. I'm glad we have a wonderful building. God's blessed us with wonderful chairs. They're the extra wide chairs with the lumbar support. I remember diligently going through, picking out the best that we could. We're glad that we can do that. It's a blessing to us. But I hope we would worship God just as well if we were all in prison together or in a sewer like they had to do in Nazi Germany. Beloved, it's good that we have these things. As Christians, we want to to be prosperous and we want to see God glorified. But we need to recognize that the kingdom of God is not, as Romans says, eating and drinking, about food, cattle, about having uh, other inventions, music. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, God said in Zechariah. I want to close with this. And I want you to consider and leave this as you consider again the goodness and the blessing that we have in the natural and in the temporal and we all want that. But what we really need and what we need to pursue is the kingdom of God by believing in Christ, bearing witness to it. It's here in the earth, in the church. It's here when we uh, love one another 
as Christ commanded us. We bear witness to it, but it is not of this world, and it's not built with with instruments of this world. God alone will bring it fully to the earth. And that's what we read in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. What are these things? But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord, that is what our Lord Jesus Christ has done. And that's what, Lord willing, we'll see when we turn to the line of Seth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have secured our fallen world in which the curse is upon the ground. We can know that our salvation, that our eternal life is secure and that we have a city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. And so we thank you and we rejoice, Lord God, for these promises. We thank you for the culture that we get from unbelievers and how many ways we are blessed by it. But Lord God, let us never idolize it and let us never use it to replace what we are called to be as Christians, witnesses of another kingdom, a divine kingdom that we can only enter by faith. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.